What's the first thing that comes to your mind when you think of Vauxhall Corsa? To me personally, it was a vehicle that you started off with on Need for Speed Underground 2. Yes, on the video game, you were able to customize the car to your heart's content. And back then in the early 2000s, you could have a flared body kit, a ridiculous paint job, and of course, not forgetting nitrous oxide spewing out from every single angle on the bonnet. Now, while that was somewhat of a fantasy for a lot of people, in reality, the Corsa in its early 2000s was actually one of the most popular cars in Britain. In fact, it still is one of the most popular cars that you'll see on our roads. And as such, the later generations have kind of taken off from that success. The thing is right now is that the Corsa is actually not as cheap as it once used to be, at least not the electric variant. It starts from 26,000 pounds. And in fact, the model we've got over here is actually 30,000 pounds. Who would have thought you would have said Vauxhall slash Opel and Corsa and 30,000 pounds in one single sentence. Now, if you'd like a detailed breakdown between the different trim levels and to understand what you actually get for the money do check out our written review will be down in the description below and also down there you'll find links to our social media platforms so if you're on twitter or instagram for example we'd very much appreciate a follow now kicking things off let's talk about the exterior design and here i think voxel opel or should i say group psa have done a really good job while it might not have the boy girl racer type of look i think it just looks really grown up from the front, you've got a little bit of a flared bonnet, nice angular headlights. At the side, you've got 16 or 17 inch alloys, a standard, the lateral on display with body colored inserts with the wheel arches and the side skirts painted in the same color of the vehicle. Speaking about paint, it'll cost you a 550 pound option if you want this blue color. However, you can also find it as a standard color as well, or indeed other cheaper alternatives. At the rear of the vehicle, you've also got a really nice boot design. It's quite familiar looking and really there's no complaints to be had over here either. I just think on the whole, Group PSA have done a really good job in terms of revamping the look and keeping it modern while also in some respect reminiscing to its uh, predecessor. Now moving inside the cabin, what you'll find is the interior feels a little bit bland, although it's very familiar looking for a lot of people and furthermore is very functional. Take for example the steering wheel, it's easy to grip. On the left hand side you've got cruise control buttons and on the right hand side you've got media controls. It just makes sense, doesn't it? In terms of its instrument cluster, it's a digital one. It can't be customized but it's bright and it provides you all the key information such as your speed, the amount of charge that you've got and the battery remaining. Furthermore, if you look around the cabin, what you'll find is physical control buttons and also volume knobs, for example. These sort of things might seem really silly to point out, but often you'll find in modern vehicles, be it electric or not, manufacturers do away with these simple functions. And it's nice to see they're being retained in the Corsa E. Now, speaking about the integration of technology and the buttons themselves, I do have to highlight the fact that the infotainment display could do with a little bit of redesign. That's specifically due to the fact that there's two black bars that reside on either side of the screen and these are pretty permanent. In other words, if you're using the built-in navigation system, Android Auto or Apple CarPlay, which all are come as standard, what you'll find is it doesn't fully utilize the seven inch or in our case, the 10 inch display, which is just a little bit of a shame and a little bit of an oversight, specifically because the black bars usually just show your climate controls and really you don't really need that because it's gonna be displayed right under it via the physical buttons itself via a small little LED. Now elsewhere at the front of the cabin, you've got the center console. And at the front, you've got a little pad for you to store away some valuables or let's say your smartphone. The issue, however, is that if you connect up your phone via USB, you'll find the phone is kind of lopsided. So a little bit of an oversight in terms of the overall size on offer here. Nevertheless, below that, you've got an easy to grip gear lever, and then you've got two cup holder spaces and a place to store away your key. The issue I find here is that the storage compartment found underneath the armrest, while it is very small and somewhat practical, is that it's only an option in the £30,000 model only, and you don't find that in the cheaper variants. I can't see why this was kind of an option. It really should be included as standard. Now, if you do want to store away, let's say a large size purse or wallet, or indeed you want to have another place for your water bottle, you've got them in the front door compartments. At the rear, however, it's a little bit more limited. Speaking about being a little bit more limited you have got the boot capacity here you've got a 13 percent less cargo volume over its gasoline variant where you've got 267 liters of usable space and with the seats down you've got 1118 liters it's worth bearing in mind that very much like some of its competitors you don't have a flat loading bay in other words there's a little bit of a lip in terms of its boot lip and also the seats themselves sit a little bit higher than the boot floor but truthfully this shouldn't really matter for your weekly shops and if you're going to be transporting large goods you're not really going to have an issue either 
either. Furthermore, I will say here in comparison to its competitors, it sits in somewhat of a middle ground. While it is larger than let's say the VW e up and the Seat Mi Electric in terms of its overall boot capacity, in terms of the cargo volume that it can have, both with the seats up or seats down, it's nowhere near in comparison to the Nissan Leaf, the Renault Zoe, or the Hyundai Ioniq Electric, which all offer more capacity. Now, if you were to keep the seats propped up at the back, what you'll find is that the Corsa e can seat five occupants, which is really nice to see. Now, the middle seat itself is a little bit stiff but otherwise it's perfectly fine. The other four seats are pretty cushiony soft and while it won't be as soft as let's say the Nissan Leaf it is really comfortable to drive specifically going the distance. At the front you've also got manually adjustable seats and it's slightly a shame not to see electronically adjustable seats in any portion or any sort of capacity. It would be nice if Vauxhall had integrated this. Now speaking about comfort the headroom and legroom throughout the cabin is pretty good. I'm just under six foot I've got no issues in terms of headroom and legroom also at the back is plentiful. If you're around six foot two or maybe six foot four, I think you'll feel a little bit more hemmed in, but on the whole, I think it's very much acceptable for a small sized hatchback. And now we get on to driving, and first off, I want to talk about the driving comfort. Now, as we're indicating, it gives me the perfect opportunity to talk about the actual indicator and wiper levers. It seems a very trivial thing to kind of mention, but it's something I did think that kind of stuck out to me as soon as I stepped inside the vehicle and put my foot down on the accelerator. Essentially, the levers are kind of diagonally positioned and a little bit higher than you'd expect. So when you're coming to the vehicle, you would feel like there's something missing on the left and right hand side of the steering wheel. Nevertheless, it's a very small point to make with something I should highlight in this section of the review. Furthermore, in terms of the, the steering wheel itself, um, it's actually really good to grip, as I mentioned before, and it's also, well, very easy to maneuver because it's quite light. The lightness of it makes it great for inner city drives. It might not be as responsive and give you that same sort of driver's feel as some of its competitors, say namely the Honda e uh, or the Mini Electric. But I think in this respect, the Corsa e is very much positioned for well your everyday drives, not for lobbing it around corners around country roads. Speaking of which, going at speed on the vehicle, you should expect a hundred kilowatts of power, which equates to around 134 horsepowers. Now that will equate to 260 newton meters of torque and as it's an all-electric vehicle you get all that amount of torque at any given point which is something that people coming from an IC based vehicle will really relish the thought of. When you put your foot down you get that amount of torque you don't have to wait for the conversion to occur. Now the 0-60 to time claimed by Vauxhall is 7.6 seconds. From my test using the V-Box Sports, I found this time to be around 7.91 seconds. Pretty much what you would expect, and given its competitors, it sits into, in somewhat in a mid-ground. It's not exactly the fastest all-electric car in the world in terms of relative to price, um, but nor is it the slowest out, out there because obviously you've got heavier vehicles out there and specifically when you look at the larger size SUVs. Now in order for you to utilize the full amount of torque and to get the most amount of responsiveness from the vehicle you need to have it running in sport mode. If you were to put it in normal or eco mode you'll find the accelerator pedal isn't as precise feeling and just is a little bit lazier. In eco mode it also limits your top speed while the top speed of the vehicle in sport mode is 93 miles an hour so it should be plentiful for those living in the UK, although those people again on the Autobahn might want a little bit more from the car. Now Eco Mode is designed for you to get the most amount of range possible and from my tests what I found is that this was ironically one of its weakest points. The Corsa E claims to run for around 200 miles on a single charge when in reality what I found is that it ran for around 130 to 140 miles. Now while that will be sufficient for a lot of people it is worth considering considering the price tag it comes in at, at around £26,000 or even in this iteration £30,000 vehicle you can get cars that hit over 200 miles such as from the Renault Zoe or the Nissan Leaf. If you were to take 130 to 140 miles as a kind of benchmark then you've got the likes of the VW e up and the Seat Mi Electric which cost around £20,000. So what I'm trying to say over here is that while its range isn't exactly class leading or nor is it absolutely disappointing or abysmal, it is worth bearing in mind that the price that you're paying for what you're getting 
is disappointing and something that I would have liked to see Group PSA kind of address. Now, another thing which doesn't really excel in comparison to its rivals is the regenerative braking mode. You've only got one to choose from and that is B mode. In order to initiate that, you have to shift down on the gear lever. While that's very easy to do, you'll have to do that each time you step inside the car, unlike some of its competitors, such as let's say the Hyundai Ionic Electric, which saves your last used mode this car will have to have it initiated each time you step inside the vehicle, which can be a little bit cumbersome, specifically if you do like driving in B mode or let's say eco and B mode combined. So in this respect as well, the B mode activation is not as harsh as I would expect. You can't really have a one pedal driving approach. You're gonna to have to resort using the brake pedal. Now, of course, using the brake pedal isn't something of a novelty. A lot of people have to do that when they're coming from a gasoline variant vehicle. It's just that for all electric cars, where they have the ability to recoup energy and indeed brake for you while you release the accelerator pedal, I would have expect this to be the case with the Corsa E. And unfortunately, it feels a little bit more like you're coasting when you take your foot off the, the accelerator pedal. Ultimately, what I'm trying to say over here is that the convenience of driving the Nissan Leaf, for example, or the Renault Zoe, or even the, the VW or Seat vehicles, is just a little bit better because they have a slightly harsher regenerative braking mode, which ultimately then recoups energy back into the battery pack a little bit more efficiently. Now for you to recharge the vehicle a little bit more efficiently, so we say you can plug it in. Of course, it's an all electric vehicle after all. Now the car has a CCS port, which has up to 100 kilowatts of input, which is nice to see at this price point. That will enable you to go from 15 to 80% in 30 minutes. If you were to go on a 50 kilowatt rapid charger, you'll find that this time extends up to 45 minutes. Now there is a type two port for those people who don't have access to rapid chargers or don't need access to rapid chargers, for example, a workplace or a home charger unit, then the type two port will take from zero to 100% in seven and a half hours. Now, while that figure might seem quite a lot, remember that is from the extremes from zero to 100. Realistically, if you're leaving the car with about 20 odd percent or 30 odd percent charge, expected to charge in around four to five hours, which is perfectly fine for running it overnight. Now, the only thing I don't like, and it's kind of an aside, is the fact that there is no place to pop your charging cables. Due to the boot design, there is no compartment storage. So for example, a little mesh design on the side compartment or a on the floor um, storage place where you can pop the cables out of view. As a result, you're gonna have the cables dangling around or alternatively, you'll have to have a bag where you can store away the cables. Just a small little point I thought I should make because some of its competitors offer these kind of storage compartments and the Corsa E doesn't. And again, it's like slightly a shame and I can understand where this has come from, where the problem has come from that is. And that is because, well, the car is basically come from directly its gasoline variant, which doesn't need these compartment storage spaces because it doesn't need a charging cable. Now on that note, it is also really disappointing to see a limited amount of technology and safety and driver assistance systems that have been built into the car. Now while the gasoline variant costs around 16,000 pounds brand new, you would expect more systems to be included as standard when it comes to a 26,000 pound car. So for example, the baseline Corsa E model does not have a rear view camera. It doesn't have front parking sensors. It doesn't have a blind spot assist. It doesn't have adaptive cruise control. Features that again, you would expect at this price point and where some of its competitors actually offer it. In fact, even the 30,000 pound variant doesn't have some of these features. And again, it is disappointing because one might expect it. It just seems like Vauxhall has taken the 16,000 pound technology and implementation and expected customers paying upwards of 26,000 pounds to be perfectly content with the kind of basic systems that are included. Now, don't get me wrong, the cruise control works as it will do in any car that's been produced in the last three decades, but that is really the biggest kind of selling point when it comes to assistance or driver 
you know, systems or safety systems, shall we say, that are integrated within the car. It's all really basic and it is, again, a little bit disappointing given the price point of the Corsa E. And this all leads me on to my verdict. What do I make about the Vauxhall or Opel Corsa E? Well, truthfully, I think the car has got a really nice exterior design. And in terms of its interior, it's practical while a little bit bland, but it will seat five occupants and have a practical boot capacity. The thing is, however, is it's all electric range and furthermore, it's price. At around 26 or even 30,000 pounds with the model we've got over here, it's competing with the likes of the Renault Zoe and the Nissan Leaf, which both offer upwards of 200 miles on a single charge. Now, if you were to take away its all electric range and say, for example, you don't really need that much amount of range, then you should consider instead the Seat Mi Electric or the VW E Up, which both offer around the same amount of mileage, but at 20,000 pounds instead. So, in reality, why would you buy the Corsa E? I'd very much be intrigued to hear your thoughts if you've purchased one or you were thinking about buying one, or indeed if it's a car that you were just considering and you came for a review to see the detailed breakdown, I'll be very much intrigued to hear your thoughts. Let me know in down in the comment section below. Of course, if you like this detailed review, give it a like, subscribe to see more from the channel, and of course, favor and share to always help it grow. I've been Chris from Totally EV. Take care and goodbye.